Okay, guys. So tonight is a little bit different, and it, prepare for a bumpy episode, okay? Because I think we have some good things Whoa, to say. Oh, come on. <laughs> no. I am confident. Elisha's been confident with this. Okay. He's, we are filming tonight's podcast. Yeah. Or if you're listening to this Tuesday morning, it's, it's the morning podcast. But we're recording it in the evening, which we usually do. And I just, I'm, my brain is like bouncing all over like a ping pong ball right now. I think the reason, I'm, this is my speculation as to why it's more of a dilemma for you than me. And that is you're, a, you're actually a YouTuber. You've got your YouTube channel, the Now That I'm a Mother YouTube channel. And you get into a YouTube mode. And then you get into a podcast mode yeah, when we do yeah, the podcast. Like when I am, when there's a camera pointing at me, I, I'm the same person, but I have right. a different personality yeah. on camera or I like my brain goes to a different place on yeah. camera than it does on the podcast. And on the podcast, like I look at Elisha, I'm not trying to interact with the camera. I'm trying to interact with him and then picturing you guys on a camera and picturing people too, but it's different. Yeah. And so this is really throwing me off because Elisha called me down to the office, which we totally redid this office space actually on my YouTube, YouTube channel. And not only do we have a camera in front of us here, but he has three cameras. Whatever. I thought, why not? You know, <laughs> in this office. And I had him put down the main camera, like viewfinder. So we can't see ourselves. Yeah. I was like, I think that'll help me just focus on like the podcast. But then now I have like this camera over to the left shooting me in the face and this one's like going up my nose over here. Nothing's going up your nose. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just overexcited about this office that Katie renovated because, yeah, that's happened since we had our last podcast episode, huh? Well, last time we said we had a very dusty basement or very dusty, yeah. Yeah, so Katie... I think Katie, that's what we said last Yeah, time. So, so Katie finished the renovation of our home office and... She made a great little corner for me to shoot my Votberg Music Academy uh, lessons. Mm -hmm. And so I had it set up over here. And then I, we have all the lights set up for shooting my music tutorials. And I had all the cameras out today. And I had the lights out today. And I was like, come on, let's just video the podcast. Yeah, Elisha's like really wanted to do this for a while. And another reason I've wanted to do it is because our family YouTube channel, the Now That We're a Family YouTube channel, has been totally... It's been non-existent for the last, what, six months? It's been dormant. Yeah, we didn't really know what to do with that thing. Yeah. Once we decided we weren't going to do family vlogs just because we were going to take our kids more offline. Right. I think that's something, too, that is kind of different about this is YouTube, to me, is such a wild place. Hmm. Like, for instance, on this podcast, like... Okay, YouTube's a very popular place. Like everyone is on YouTube. Right. Everyone of every belief, of every stance, of every mm. background. And the way you're found is through an algorithm, like anywhere else. But that means that people can stumble upon your video without any context to who you are. Yeah. And leave their opinion. Right. And that is stressful <laughs> when you're talking about a faith that is un popular yeah. when you're talking about views that are very un, un yeah. I, I don't know, unpopular politically correct right. when you aren't using all the right terminology mm. it's really easy to just get trolled and i think on the podcast you could say well it's the same thing but it's like the way that y new people find our podcast is via you guys sharing it yeah it's very it, on purpose yeah and you guys share to your like-minded friends mm -hmm. Or you write reviews and they go to like-minded people. Right. And so this stays a very like-minded, happy place for us where I feel like Elisha and I feel very safe yeah. to share what the Lord is truly impressing on our hearts without intimidation of, okay, what are, what's so-and-so going to think from such and such a background? Right. Right. And you guys get more context for what we're saying over time, obviously. But then I feel like it's the same thing with Instagram. I stopped sharing sit down videos about my faith or about more polarizing topics on YouTube as well. And I just started sharing bits and pieces of that on Instagram Yeah, because I don't use hashtags on Instagram. I don't try to get found by lots of people. Again, I'm found by you guys sharing to your like minded mm -hmm. friends. So this is just like a completely new environment. I guess it's very it's not new because I've been here before and I'm intimidated. Yeah. Well, but we want, we ultimately just want the Lord to be glorified yeah. and we want to encourage people 
right. that are like minded. Yeah. And so maybe we'll do it uh, through this platform. Maybe we will not. Right. But you know, I told Elisha, okay, we'll give it a shot, but I'm not like agreeing to anything. Like I'm not signing a contract, Yes, but we're doing this tonight. And cause I think we both really want to protect that freedom that we feel to speak really where from where our hearts are at and what the Lord's teaching us. Yeah. And you kind of have to protect your confidence yep. in that way too. Cause if you just get hammered a ton, it's, I don't know. You, f- you feel less well, likely to share. It's just not that heart. fun. Yeah. It's just not <laughs> like, that fun to get hammered. This isn't a fun thing to share, mm-hmm. but yeah. Uh, also from a very just practical standpoint, I know we're kind of talking about this a lot, but it might make a difference in what we do with the podcast. So I think it will be applicable to you guys. Um, but putting on your makeup at like eight or nine at night just <laughs> seems really, uh, yeah. And those I are don't the even things know I what that's not, I didn't think of that today <laughs> when I was, when I decided that we should put the, do the video. I put makeup on. If you are watching this, you can see, uh, but I did not do my hair because I, I was like, there's no way I'm like curling my hair and then going to sleep in an hour. <laughs> like that's not going to happen. But anyways. Okay. Yeah. Enough of that. If you want to watch the video, it's on the now that we're a family YouTube channel. And I don't know if we'll continue doing video. We're doing it this week. So there you go. (laughs) Enough of the prelude. Give your vote. Uh, Yeah. Okay. So we want to talk about living in two kingdoms, Mm -hmm. which is kind of like what we were talking about, the podcast kingdom and the YouTube kingdom. It's actually not what I had in mind. (laughs) It's not? It's not what I had in mind. Okay. What did you have in mind? Well, this is something that Katie and I, I think constantly and will regularly come back to the reality that we have to pay bills here in this earth. We have to feed these physical bodies. Uh, and being parents, you have to take care of the physical needs of your children. And yet we are spiritual beings as well. We've got an eternal soul and there are eternal implications to how we conduct ourselves in these physical bodies, but we are supposed to live in both of them at the same time. And I think that's a dilemma for any Christian. Like I said in the intro, I think that's a dilemma. Uh, But some things that are hitting us more pertinently as of late are things like providing for young children and raising up, at least for me, raising up young children to hopefully thrive and be able to conduct themselves in this world, but to still have an eternal perspective, you know? So how do you equip your children to have the practical skill sets, you know, to be educated to a level where they're able to go out into the workplace or out into the marketplace and, and carry their own weight or provide for their own and yet have an eternal perspective. And so, yeah, that's what we've been talking about. That's what I've been thinking about. And so we've shared, I guess we've both written down some thoughts and this is kind of a fun one because I I don't know what Katie's points are and I don't think you know what my points are. Yeah, no, we basically, when we were talking about this episode, Elisha was bringing up some things that he wanted to talk about. And I was like, those are great, but I don't feel like I have anything to say on those, on those topics, I guess. And so we came up with the title of this episode and then both came up with how, just what that meant to us yeah, specifically and, and what it looks like in our unique roles living in two kingdoms. That's right. That's right. So do you want to start or do you want me to start? Uh, I, what do you want to do? Well, did I we guess explain what the two kingdoms are? You did. I think, I mean, I don't know if I'm very good at explaining what the two <laughs> you kingdoms probably are. probably did and I was just blacking out. Well, no, I guess, yeah. So I'm talking about this physical world, like the one we yeah. can feel and we touch and their, their sin is, you know, rampant in this physical world. And then that's one kingdom. And then there's got, there's the kingdom that's eternal, you know, where we're going, where we yeah. are going to spend eternity in our new, new bodies, um, that are faultless and that are sinless in the presence of almighty and perfect God. And the only reason we have that hope to spend that eternity with before almighty God is because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Yes. Uh, So anyways, those are the two kingdoms Mm -hmm. we're talking about. Yeah. And I think it's really easy, especially like where Elisha and I have been, you know, looking into more doctrine, more theology, stuff like that. It's really easy to feel like, okay, well, I, I want to be in this spiritual place. I think Christians have always struggled with this and yet my kids and family are here right and as a mom that's very practical there's laundry there's cooking there's education Mm -hmm. there's even things like sex Mm -hmm. that are great yeah (laughs) that are great but these are our ministry in a very practical way at least they can be 
or ministry in a practical way. Mm -hmm. These are amoral things to a certain extent, not the sex one. (laughs) (laughs) Why did I bring up the sex? I don't know. (laughs) Because I was thinking that these are, I think sometimes women, we don't view these as like, these should be priorities of ours. Hmm. As wives, as mothers, these are actually priorities. Hmm. These are very physical, earthly things. And I think sometimes as women, we can spiritualize away Hmm. things like sex and be like, well, this is a physical, carnal desire. It's not necessary. I'm going to be over here reading my Bible. Gotcha. You know. Yeah. But it is a ministry to our husbands. Yes. It can be a ministry to me too. Okay. Uh So moving on. (laughs) But I grew up knowing a family where the mom was always gone uh, street preaching. Hmm. That was her thing. She's street preaching. They had 10 kids. And now that we're all grown up, two of her children are walking with the Lord. She lost her marriage and she also lost or, or eight of her 10 children are lost. Hmm. And, but she elevated that ministry so far above the ministry of her family. And right. I think it's just such a warning because I think we can sometimes feel like the things we're doing on a day in and day out basis are not kingdom work. Right. And, and I don't, but this is something I do want to say is that they can also not be kingdom work. Yes. They're not just in it of themselves. It's not in and of themselves kingdom work right. because I think sometimes I've heard that on female podcasts where like, no, like raising your kids or doing the laundry or doing the dishes, like that's kingdom work. And it's like, well, it can be. Yes. And I think that's something that I want to dive into a little bit more. Right. Like depending on where your heart is, where your mind is, how you're doing it. Well, don't jump to my points. Yeah, okay. <laughs> wow. Well, my curiosity is peaked. Um, oh yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay, so what's what's an area though that you feel like? Sure. So likewise, as a man, you know, we've got these. At least as a Christian man, I've got a desire that yeah to preach the gospel, to see Christ's name proclaimed on a huge level, and to you see all the needs outside of your home. It, it's like they're so apparent, and the child crying at your knee. Or, you know, the wife that maybe is going through the wife crying at your knee, (laughs) the wife crying at my knee. No, you never cry at my knee. Uh, the wife, I don't what the wife, why do I keep saying the wife? Okay. (laughs) Moving on. (laughs) No, the needs of, I think the needs, the needs, (laughs) the wife. I feel like I just got reduced to the needs. No. Uh, basically I've got. I've, I feel like there's a biblical mandate. I mean, in fact, there is it's first Timothy chapter. Actually, I wrote it down. First Timothy, Timothy chapter five, verse eight says he that provideth not for his own, for his own relatives. And for those of his own household are worse than an unbeliever or an infidel. And this is in the context of this, you know, Paul's writing to Timothy and he's kind of laying out some practical guidelines for how to use the church ministry, the church funds, you know, when should you take care of widows? When should you not take care of widows? And he's saying, Hey, if they've got a family, it's more, it's more important that the family take care of them because it's actually worse for that family. If they don't provide for their own, it's worse for them than an unbeliever. And I think of that as a father and as the leader of my household, that is a first and foremost spiritual mandate from God. It's a physical thing, providing money and providing food and providing clothes, but it's a spiritual mandate from God. And so to overlook it is overlooking a huge part of our Christian faith. And like I was just how I shared of that mother, and, and I'm not saying any of us are, I guess the reason why I shared about her is not to put her down, but to say, I think this can be a trap that we can fall into yeah. and we don't realize till it's too late. Mm-hmm. And likewise, I've grown up seeing actually a lot of men not provide in the name of God will provide. So I'm just sitting here. I'm reading my Bible. I'm doing, I'm praying. They're ultra spiritualizing a very practical Hmm. aspect of life, which is provision. Yeah. Getting a job or working. Yeah. It's like, well, maybe just go get a job, Uh you know, like the Lord will provide. And, And I, My, my, my third angle just turned off, Elisha. <laughs> my third camera angle is no longer working. Are you going to reset that or do I just not have a... Yeah, do you want me to? No, I don't care. Hey. <laughs> well, I didn't know if you cared. Okay, I just needed to let you know. But anyways, I just think it's so, it's so important. Sometimes we can think, oh, these practical things are beneath us. Mm-hmm. 
when really, like you said, it's a spiritual calling. Yes. This practical act is a spiritual calling. Yeah. Or it can be. Yes, exactly. Right. Because you can do the same act in a very unspiritual way, in a very disobedient way, actually, in a way that's in rebellion to God. You can go out and get a job and make money and provide for your family in a way that's not honoring to him, too. Yeah, I think sometimes you forget that Jesus had to care for practical things, too, while he was here on earth, while he was 100% about God's work. Yes. When you picture, he he (laughs) knew he came here for a very specific purpose, and yet he learned a trade. He was a carpenter. He provided for himself. I think often we forget that his full-time ministry was like, I think, what, three years? Well, that's documented. That's documented. Yeah, I'm sure he was ministering, you know, Oh yeah, his life was was, his ministry, like Jesus' life here on earth. But the full-time, I don't know, where he's doing his miracles and just like full-time devoting himself to training disciples, it was not very long. Right, three years, yeah. I I feel like I've heard three years somewhere, so that's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I think that's a commonly accepted timeline from like 30 to 33. (laughs) Look it up if I'm like six months, yeah. I think he started it at 30. So, But you look at it too, like David was a king. That's a very... Big job to have. Yeah. Joseph oversaw all the grain collecting. Crane? The grain collecting. Grain collecting, yes. You know what I mean? Like he was like, like cranes back then? Stop. I need to work on my enunciation. Someone messaged me the other day on Instagram and told me I was pronouncing Coeur d'Alene wrong. Because oh. I was pronouncing it weird. And I think I was just slurring it. Because <laughs> I know how to pronounce Coeur d'Alene. Hopefully. No, I do. If you say it wrong, then I'm saying it wrong No, too. no. The way she described it was how I just said it, which okay. is Coeur d'Alene. But Naomi and Ruth, they, on the other hand, were totally broke. Like, women back in the Bible days didn't have a lot going for them sure. as far as, like, an yeah, easy way to make th- money. Right. Yeah. And so they're, you'd better believe, like, their full-time job was figuring out how do we get food on the table. Right. I, I guess the Lord has used so many different people with so many different responsibilities. And... You know, being fully immersed in God's kingdom doesn't mean sitting in a quiet house with, you know, your 10-year Bible time with essential oils floating over here and kumbaya Yeah. Like, that's not... That's not yeah. what living in a spiritual kingdom it, looks like. Well, it could look like that, or it could look like being in Africa serving children, or it could it look like... It doesn't look like that as a parent. You can't have the oils going? <laughs> Which part do you not get as a parent? No, I mean, just sitting in a quiet house, having like long Bible times, just, you know, like you look at, I read this book once, The Death of a Guru. The guy sat in a coma, I think for eight years. His wife fed him. He was literally, he was alive, but he was in a spiritual coma. He was Hindu. It was a Hinduistic coma. So like he put himself in it? Yeah. He was putting himself in the coma and everyone just thought he was so spiritual, but he was living this like living death of like ultimate zen (laughs) yeah apparently i mean but like sometimes you can think that well all i'm saying i i I think i know what you're saying but a long bible time in a quiet house with essential oils uh being diffused sounds nice i don't i think that's a nice thing to have every once in a while i should rephrase this that is not the only way to be fully immersed in god's kingdom yeah and maybe doing that while you're neglecting something else is actually counterproductive well we're talking about living here in two kingdoms because we really should be fully concerned with the things that are above mm. and have this eternal perspective. And yet, on the other hand, we are very consumed with practical needs here on earth. Yes. And so you can live in both, I guess is what I'm saying. And yes. you don't need to neglect one in order to elevate the other. Yes. And it's easy for these things to get out of balance. You know, you look at Martha and she elevated her to-do list above christ right and and that's a danger Mm -hmm. for you know a mom to be like oh i'm doing kingdom work i'm you know doing the laundry i'm cleaning the dishes and i'm so busy doing these things and serving my family and serving my husband and serving the community with hospitality that i don't have time to sit at the feet of jesus and listen to him and learn from him yeah yes yeah no i i 100 percent agree with everything you're saying katie And I think that from my perspective, when I look at it in regards to having a Bible time, not having a Bible time, you know, when's it time to feed the children? When's it time to not feed the children? You know, Colossians three tells us, set your mind on things above 
for your life is that's where your life is hid with Christ on high. And I was like, that's where our existence is. That's like the real existence is up there with our, with, with Christ and our minds should be there and our hearts should be there. And I think that our minds and hearts can be there while participating and tending to the physical needs of this earth. Uh, and so would you agree? Yeah, for sure. That verse, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul. mind, all your soul, right. all your strength. Obviously that's a very big command. Sure. But I guess this is what I'm saying. I don't think when the Lord commanded that, that meant you just go sit in a corner, isolate all else and try to right. zone in right. on all those things. Like no. I need to devote this to the Lord. Yes. It's really hard to devote everything to the Lord. You know, like when your toddler just like spilt something on the floor right? and you got to pick it up right then. <laughs> but in that moment, what's our attitude? What's our heart posture? Right. What's our, you know, do we have an attitude of worship? Do we have an attitude of thankfulness? Right. Do we have an attitude of faith? Yes. How are we interacting? That could really determine our perspective. Yes. Yeah. And where life. our heart and mind are at. And where our heart and mind yeah. are at. Yeah. I guess like since I really started reading the Bible a lot more and being a lot more invested and encouraged by spiritual things, mm -hmm. the more I realized just my earthly perspective has changed and I'm doing the exact same things in my day in a completely different way hmm. with a completely different mindset. And a lot of that has to do with who I'm listening to, honestly. Yes. What's what you're putting into your head. Yeah. That totally makes sense. Uh, so something else that I think is a challenge because we were just talking about like being a parent but then I also think being a citizen, I mean, I'm, you know, Katie just said we're citizens of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Now we're citizens of the United States of America. Um, we're citizens in this world and yet that's not our permanent residence, but we are citizens here and in being citizens, the Bible just has an interesting way of telling us who we are in Christ. And then even acknowledging that like, yeah, you're going to have some annoying earthly leaders and rulers but go ahead and submit to them while you're there. And, and I'm, I'm obviously I'm using my own language here. But <laughs> Don't look this verse up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, when the Pharisees come to Jesus in Matthew 22 and they say, hey, you know, Caesar says that we need to give unto, give unto him, you know, pay, pay his dues, pay the taxes to him. And this was a great way for them to try to challenge Jesus because Caesar claimed that he was God. And so they're saying, so does this guy say that, we should give to Caesar what he wants because Caesar's a crazy guy and he says he's God. And I love that Jesus just says, well, Hey, give me the, give me the money. Give me the token. And whose emblem is on that? And he goes, well, Caesar's is, and he goes, okay, we'll give to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's and give to God, the things that are God or render into Caesar, the things that are Caesar's and render into God, the things that are God's. And I love that Jesus's perspective on that. And of course it's perfect because he's God is saying, Hey, there's worldly things and there's spiritual things. Like, why are you caught up in this physical piece of money and who gets it or who doesn't get it? And a lot, I mean, that's all Caesar gets. Like the only thing Caesar gets is of this earth. And so go ahead and render it to him. You know, he's gained his power here through his conniving and through whatever p political schemes he's had. So let him have his stuff, but render to God, the things that are God's. And he's somehow they're differentiating between these physical things and the spiritual things. Yeah. And sometimes physical beings start demanding things that are God's and that's where we draw the line. Right. You know, sometimes the government will demand our worship or our that yes. God has already ordained and claimed as his. as his. That's right. And that's when we have to defer. And I think sometimes that's a line that we can confuse. But I love that too. You brought up an interesting point when we were talking the other day, how Paul was living in a very corrupt government yep. in Rome. All the apostles were really, yeah. or most of them. Right. I don't actually know where they were geographically located for the most part, but I know Rome was definitely lording over Israel or yeah. Jerusalem. And what's so cool is he w didn't start leading a political re revolution. Right. His beef wasn't to pick with the Romans. Right. He was saving Gentiles. He was preaching the gospel to Jews and Gentiles. Right. And... And Rome was just this side thing. And it mm. would have been so easy. You know, the Jews missed the Messiah because they thought he was going to come overturn Rome. That's right. They thought he was going to be a political powerhouse. We've yeah. always wanted a political yeah. leader that's going to overturn 
the po- bad politics, right. the, the negativity, the corrupt government the corruption that, we see, that we see, yeah, that we're living in. And yeah. I just thought that was such an interesting perspective that mm. he was so about a spiritual kingdom, and he, I think he had such a good perspective, which is the perspective Jesus had. It, this is all going to perish away, yeah. so don't waste your sweat and your anxiety and your tears over trying to overthrow the government. Put it into, you know, be fishers of men. Yes. Put it into eternal souls, eternal yeah. kingdom. And I think that's just a challenge for me on a day in and day out basis. You know, we're coming into an election season. All kinds of things are going on in America and worldwide right yep. now, politically. And it's just like, where's our anxiety going? Where's our effort going? First of all, we should be anxious for nothing. But if these things are taking over our thought life, we are not living in an eternal kingdom, right? Like perspective, perspective wise, wise and yeah. heart wise, we just aren't. Right. We're very caught up in the things of this earth. That's right, and that doesn't mean we're indifferent towards these things. It means we approach them through the lens and through the perspective of an eternal, uh, eternal perspective. Well, and when you have the re- eternal perspective, you realize how small they are. Yeah. I feel like when I care the most is when I'm trying to cling to my house and I don't want my taxes to go up and I don't want inflation to happen. Right. And I don't, I want to be able to go outside without a mask and I don't want to get sick. Yeah. And you know what I'm saying? These are all very physical, very short term things. Yes. Yeah. Those are all very, like, it's, that's all very earthly yes. perspective. 100%. Yeah. I'm not saying I haven't done any of that. Anyways. Okay. I've got one more point. Share your point. Okay. So I talked about being a father. I talked about being a citizen, but it's interesting, especially as of late, I've realized how many goals and dreams and aspirations I've had that that were solely for this world. They were solely for this physical world and they were becoming idols. And I wasn't, these weren't goals that I feel like the Lord placed on my heart. I think I would say things like, oh, the Lord put this desire in my heart or this is a, you know, a dream that the Lord gave me and I I think I should be able to pursue it wholeheartedly and with, you know, reckless abandon. And, uh, again, I'm not going to say that God doesn't put dreams on our hearts or, you know, he's clearly worked that way through the Bible. And I think he probably still does work that way through people. Uh, but it seems like whenever he does that, it's always so yielded to his perfect and sovereign and divine plan. And, Ideally, the person carrying out that dream or those aspirations are yielded to that purpose and that vision. And I guess all I'm saying is that in recent years, that has not been my mindset. I had my dreams for this earth and for this world, and they were not yielded to God's perfect design and sovereign plan. Uh, I I, I just wanted them for my reasons. They were 100% like my goals for my dreams for this for this world. And uh, it's fun to have those from time to time. But of course, we know they're going to let us down. You know, even if all these dreams are fulfilled here on earth, it's like we then our bodies get old and they die. You know, like everything perishes away. It fades away like the grass. And uh, and I think about having my goals and dreams and aspirations conformed or looking at them through the lens of eternity. It doesn't mean I, you know, I just do away altogether with dreams but I'm looking that at them in light of eternity. And I think, oh boy, I'd love to be able to, you know, live in this type of home or I'd love to be able to make this type of income. But then you think about it and you're like, to, to what end? Like, what am I willing to sacrifice to get to that level of income or to get to that quality of home or whatever, whatever the thing is in your brain, uh, the, the things that it go through my brain that I've wanted where I think, what, wait a second, where do I want to, my citizenship isn't even here. Like this isn't, even my home. This is a very part-time thing that I'm passing through. And I think of the Pilgrim's Progress narrative that is so good to keep in mind. Like when you look at that, when you look at it from the perspective of reading a book, you're like, oh man, life's so short. And there's all these trials and temptations and opportunities that come throughout a person's life. But it's it's so short in light of eternity. But when you're in it, it's sometimes all you can see. And that's when it's dangerous. I want to have the spiritual eyes to see, not just the physical eyes. That's really encouraging. And I think that it's such a fine line. And that's why we have to be so in tune with Holy Spirit. And I think constantly going to God's word because like, for instance, being healthy can be like, you know, taking care of your temple, caring for your spouse, wanting to be there for your kids, or it can be idolizing your body. Right. right. You know, like the same act 
can be done in two different ways and have two different mindsets, Mm. you know, and be two different things really. And man looks at the outside, like, what do you do? Who are you? How do you look? How much are you worth? Yeah. Like that's what man looks at. And the Lord looks at the heart. And I think the cool thing is, is the Lord looks at the heart regardless of your success level, the regardless of your appearance, the regardless of, of anything. Mm -hmm. So we're supposed to work heartily as under the Lord. We're supposed to, I feel like do our best and magnify our our talents, you know, take care of what he's given us and steward that well. Yeah. But it's not, I guess it's just coming back to like, what's the end goal? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that it's, that it's a heart. Yes. It's a heart issue. And and that's the cool thing. It says the Lord tries the hearts. He's the judge of the hearts. And that's why we have to be so careful to judge other people because it's really hard for us to discern that because we so quickly stereotype based on the things we can see. Yes, that's right. And you know, what's crazy. James four talks about, I think it's James four 13 where that's the passage that says, come you who say tomorrow I'm going, I'm going to go into such and such a city and I'm going to stay there for a week and I'll buy and sell and make a profit. And then I'll come back here. He, and then he goes on to say, you don't even know what tomorrow is going to bring. Instead, say, if the Lord wills, then I'll do such and such a thing. And I think that's 413, but but before that, in chapter 4, it's chapter, yeah, chapter 4, verse 4, it's where it's that sobering, that sobering thought where it says, do you not know that friendship with this world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever would be a friend of this world makes himself an enemy of God. And so that's like the lead up to that don't have your mind all here on earth and be presumptuous and say, hey, I'm going to go build this business and then I'm going to invest into this property and you know save this amount of money, whatever the thing is that you're saying or thinking. It says, if the Lord wills. But prior to that saying, don't even have your heart set on this world. You know, Friendship with this world is enmity with God. Therefore, who would ever make himself a friend of this world makes himself an enemy of God. And that's James 4.4. 4. Wow. And I thought, wow, what a sober perspective in regards to having, you know, worldly or earthly goals and aspirations uh, versus having an eternal mindset. Yeah, that's super weighty because you think of the things that make you a friend of the world mm. and it's so tempting to want to be a friend of the world. And you know what's interesting is how in Matthew, you know, I... I feel like this is a side note, but I feel like 2018, 2019, 2020, we're just like the most offended people group that's ever lived. Like the most offended generation. Sure. We get offended by everything. But it's so interesting to read Matthew how many times the Bible says the Pharisees were offended Hmm. or this statement that Jesus said offended them. And they're constantly getting offended by the truth. Hmm. And Jesus was always speaking the truth in love. Hmm. Often he was speaking the truth in parables in Matthew, mm. but it still was offen- offensive, not because of what he was saying, but because of, but because Jesus Christ is a stumbling stone and because mm-hmm. he's not a friend of the world. And you can love the people in the world without being a friend to the world and the world's value system. Mm. And that's something that the world doesn't understand. And that's something that I think Christians have a hard time believing yeah. too, because... Right. We want to be liked and we want to be appreciated and we don't want to be the problem. And we all know that person in our life that likes the conflict that just goes around stirring up trouble. And we know that that's wrong. And so in order to avoid being that, we just kind of get wishy-washy or hide part, the hard parts of the gospel or not be bold about our faith because we know that that's going to be offensive too. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> You're so right. You know, it's like this. Yeah. It's this like weird little. Yeah, it's like we d- we rope. don't think that we can be loving to people without being friends to the world or friends yes. to the things that are associated with this people. Yeah, you can be a friend to a person. You can be loving to a person for sure. Oh uh, yeah, we're called being, to that. Being friends with the world is something we should not want or do. Yeah. So, anyways, those are the thoughts. Those are the thoughts we've just kind of been thinking through as we are very much living here in the present, establishing ourselves in Coeur d'Alene, putting down very practical roots, right? And also coming in from this perspective of this world is not our home. Mm-hmm. 
you know, we are just passing through Jesus. We want you to come. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we want the thought of Jesus returning and reigning to always excite us. Yeah. There's been times even in the recent past where the thought of Jesus returning was like, Oh, that's, I know that's a good thing. Like my faith tells me that's good, but I'd prefer if, you know, we got our new house first okay, or yeah. we got, you know, and whatever the thing is you're waiting Legit, for. Legit, the only time I wanted Jesus to actually come back was when I was in the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. And then since moving to this house, I feel like I've had that perspective of, Lord, I'm excited if you come and I'm excited if you wait. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so that's some of the, some of the things we're talking through and, and processing. And now we got to do it with you and, and, and you, YouTube. So right. glad you were here. <laughs> Folks, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we, we're grateful that we have so many of you in our life, whether it's from afar or people that we get to see in person. Uh, so many of you encourage us on a regular basis, whether it's via Instagram or through leaving ratings and reviews. And that's just a huge blessing to both Katie and myself because uh, we want to live out this life in a way that's honoring to God. And we want to carry out this faith and live in the faith. And so many of you are doing the same thing and inspiring and encouraging us to continue on. Yes. Thank you guys so much for that. And we will see you and, and you'll hear from us because we won't actually see you next week. Next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>